We're on. All right, so if you got your Bible today, um, we're going to review a couple of things here that we hit on last week, and we're going to move right along. Um, last week we talked about Isaiah 52.3, so let's go there real quick. Isaiah 52.3, and I want you to see something here um, that I pointed out to you last time, I believe. It says, For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught, and ye, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Now, last time we talked about this, we talked about redemption it comes only through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God says here that he's going to redeem his people without money. He's going to buy them back without money. What's he going to buy them with? First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Take a look at verse 18. Bible says, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Notice that before you came to Christ, your conversation was vain. Everything you did was vain. When you got up in the morning, that was vain. When you went through your day of work, that was vain. When you spent time with your family, that was vain. Everything was vain. Why? Because Jesus Christ won't in it. When you live your life outside of Jesus Christ, you are living a life of vanity. I want you to think about that. How many people out here live in vanity every day? I look at people at my job and I watch people come and go and I'm out here driving around and I walk in these grocery stores and Walmarts and places like that, and I look around and I wonder how many of these people know Jesus Christ, and I think, look at all these people and all the things that they're fretting over and all the things that they're worried about and all the things that they're stressed over and they don't have Jesus Christ in their life. They're living a vain conversation without Jesus Christ. Because anything outside of Christ is worthless. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. Just check to see if you're awake there. Uh, you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Anything you try to do outside of what God redeems you with is corruptible. You say, well, I joined the church. Good for you, but that's corruptible. If you're expecting that to get you to heaven. If you shook the preacher's hand and you thought that was going to get you a ticket in, that's a corruptible thing in your mind because the preacher shaking your hand is not going to get you into heaven. Your mama and your daddy being saved is not going to get you saved. There's a lot of people, I'm going to tell you right now, I've been a preacher for a long time, there, and I've been around a lot of preachers in the time that I've been uh, in the ministry and the time I've been saved. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of preachers uh, that have family members and kids that are just as lost as the day is long. And they're just as mean, and they're just as demon-possessed and evil as any man out there walking on the streets doing drugs. Why? Because they think that they, or a preacher's kid, is going to get them to heaven, and they're wrong. Jesus Christ even told the religious Pharisee, Nicodemus, your religion can't get you to heaven. See, see, Nicodemus is in his religious robes and he's over there doing his religious thing. He thinks, well, I'm a, I'm a saved man because I'm a Pharisee and I belong to the synagogue and I go to the temple and I, of all places, I live in Jerusalem. The holy city. But Jesus looked at him and said, ye must be born again. Your religion ain't going to get you there, buddy. You have to have a personal relationship. And I mean personal. 
Your wife can't do it for you. Your husband can't do it for you. Your mama can't do it for you. Your daddy can't do it for you. Your aunt, your uncle, and your grandma can't do it for you. You have to have a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and you have to know Him, and He has to know you in order for you to go up uh, when you die or go up when the rapture happens. Other than that, you're going down. All of it's vain. You know what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes? He said, vanity, oh vanity, all is vanity, except the preacher. What was he talking about? He said, under the sun. Now you need to mark that when you read Ecclesiastes. The preacher is looking under the sun. But I'm here to tell you there's something above the sun, and that's Jesus Christ. And when you get to know Him, and He lives inside of you, then it's not vanity, oh vanity, saith the preachers. It's glory, hallelujah, says the preacher. But he's looking under the sun. See? He's looking at people that are in the secular realm, in the natural realm, without a relationship with God. Keep reading. The Bible says, From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Now, tradition is not always a bad thing. Churches have traditions. Countries have traditions. Families have traditions. We have a family tradition every year. We get together. We eat Thanksgiving turkey. Okay, that's a tradition. But if you're expecting your traditions to get you to heaven, you're trusting the wrong thing. See? <clears throat> now, verse 19 gives you the answer. But with the... What does that next word say? Precious. precious you better underline that word precious. Because John MacArthur knows nothing about it. He says the blood of Jesus Christ is ordinary blood that went in the ground and went away. He said the blood itself did not redeem anybody. Don't believe me? Go read his commentaries. Go read his Bible. I got a copy over there. I'll be happy to show it to you. <laughs> he says it's the death of Christ that saves a man, not his blood. To which I say you're a heretic. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells you that the blood that Jesus Christ shed for your sins was precious. That means it's not ordinary. That means there's something to that blood that's connected to your redemption that you can't get redeemed without it. It's not just the death of Jesus Christ. We believe the death of Jesus Christ saves. Yes, we acknowledge that. But we also acknowledge it had to be a specific type of death that saves you. And that specific death required all the blood in Jesus Christ's body to be poured out. And it didn't just go in the ground, by the way. It went down to the heart of the earth. And then Jesus took that blood and went to the throne of God and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. If you don't know that, you don't know the book of Hebrews because the Bible says he took it through the Spirit and sprinkled it right on the mercy seat. And I'm not talking about the one in Jerusalem. I'm talking about the one in heaven. As an eternal reminder of what God did for you. The Bible says the blood speaks. It's alive. Because God's in it. <clears throat> the Bible says with the uh, precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There's some knuckleheads running around today saying that Jesus Christ uh, was an ordinary man and he made mistakes. If you've ever seen the movie The Son of God and uh, what was that other crazy movie that they put out that went along with that carry that me and you watched and had a good laugh at? What was it called? Um, the Apostles of Christ or something like that? It was put out by that lady that did Touch by an Angel. What was that movie called? Roma, 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 Downing. Roma Downing. Roma Downing, yeah. You know she's a New Ager, right? You know, she was dabbling into that New Age stuff. So she had Jesus up there not even knowing He was the Messiah. And she had 13 apostles up there instead of 12. And one was a female. Imagine that. 
Mary Magdalene. You see the connection? That goes back to Dan, Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, where he says that Jesus Christ was born as a bastard child and he had a relationship with Mary Magdalene and they were uh, romantically involved and the cup represented their relationship together. The Holy Grail. Now this is the kind of stuff that's put out in universities across America that blaspheme your Lord and your Savior. That's where your children are going to college and learning trash while they're trying to get an education. The education they're getting is to teach them how to hate God or have a false view of Him. Everybody that talks about Jesus ain't talking about the Jesus of the Bible, folks. Take your Bible and look at uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Moving right along. Chapter 11. Verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Show you something here. want to mess the college crowd up, I'll show them this one. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear, now watch it, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh, preacheth, Another Jesus. See that thing? Watch it. Whom we have not preached, or if you receive <clears throat> another spirit. Is that word spirit capitalized or lowercase? lowercase? That lowercase s indicates it's referring to the scriptures. And there are those out there that are presenting another scripture to you. That is not the holy scripture that you hold in your hand. Hello, NIV, New American Standard, Amplified, ABC, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Goofy versions. All right, the Bible says here, which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you may well bear with him. Now listen, Paul tells you in these verses that there is another Jesus out there. And I'm not talking about the guy running around in Mexico called Jose. I'm talking about somebody that comes to your door and knocks on your door and says, I'm here to talk about Jesus, but when you pin them down, it's not the Jesus of the Bible. So how do you know, preacher? You get your Bible out and you start finding out what they believe and compare it to the Scriptures and you'll find out real quick they don't believe the Scriptures. See? The Mormon God says there are many gods and that Jesus once was a man and had to elevate himself to Godhood. And you can do the same thing, by the way. Read it. I got the Book of Mormon over there. I'll show it to you. It's right there in the Doctrine and Covenants. The Book of Abraham. Pearl of Great Price. And a few others that they don't talk about today. <laughs> When they come to you and they knock on the door and they say, hey, we're here to present a Jesus to you, but it's a Jesus that's created and he's lesser than God the Father. And he, there was a time that he didn't exist and he, in the Old Testament he was Michael the Archangel, but now we know him as Jesus. Do you know enough Bible to know that that's not true? I know a lot of Christians out here that follow hook, line, and sinker for that kind of nonsense. Oh, how about this one? How about the uh, one that Oral Roberts pushed over there? And he said, uh, Jesus showed up to me in, uh, in, uh, last night, and uh, he was 600 foot tall. And he told me if I didn't raise $2 million, God was going to kill me. Is that Jesus of the Bible? 
This is the same guy that had a platform that where he was supposedly healing people, he had a metal platform, had a guy off to the side with a button, and when people stood on the platform at his cue, they pushed the button, electricity go through the uh, metal uh, plate, and knock the people off their back, and he claimed the Holy Spirit knocked them out. That's old Roberts. The one that mentored and taught Kenneth Copeland. And Copeland flew his plane for him for many years. That's the same clown that had the Catherine Kuhlman running around up there on stage with her mysticism. That's another Jesus, folks. It's another gospel that's being preached. You better know which dispensation you're in when you open that Bible, and you better know the differences between those dispensations. So when these guys come to your door, you can spot them out, and you can teach them something instead of them deceiving you. Next thing you need to know about this blood atonement is it's brought about through the blood atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. We just talked about that. Jesus Christ bought you back from the devil. And you've been bought. You've been bought. What does that mean? That means somebody owns you. That means you are somebody's possession. Like it or not, I know we live in America. I know everybody's free. I know we fly the flag, you know, and Fourth of July and all that good stuff. But let me tell you something. You are owned by somebody. Either the devil owns you or God owns you. There's no other choice. And I'd much rather be owned and possessed by God than the devil. Amen. I have Jesus Christ is my master. And boy, is he a good one. He takes care of me. He feeds me. He clothes me. He gives me everything I need. And he gives me a lot of my wants. Amen. I mean, I get out here sometimes and I'm out here in the yard praying. I look around and I say, you know, a lot of people look at this place and think, well, there's not much to this place. But I tell you what, it means everything to me because everything that I've got out here, God gave it to me. Amen. I don't have the stress and the headache of some of these multimillionaires that go and blow their brains out because they can't figure out how to pay the mortgage. I don't have that stress. Why? Because God takes care of me. Amen. I used to go out to some of those multi-million dollar homes out in California. I used to party in some of those places. And I'd watch those men that owned those mansions and those directors. They'd sit in the corners of those rooms at night time when the party was over. And I'd watch them cry like a baby because they didn't know God and they didn't know how to find Him. You want that kind of lifestyle? There's plenty of money in it, but there's no peace in it. I watched a documentary the other night about Phil Hartman and how his wife was wrought by drugs and messed up so bad, she went in there and blew his brains out. And then she blew her own brains out. Why? Because she didn't know God. And you know what she did the very night she killed him and killed herself? She went to her best friend and she looked at him and she says, do you believe in God? And you know what he said? He shrugged his shoulders and walked away. That was a perfect opportunity to stop that tragedy by introducing her to Jesus Christ. And he wouldn't do it because he didn't know Christ. That's the tragedy of being in a situation where you don't know your Redeemer. The next thing you need to know about redemption is found in Exodus <clears throat> 6 6. We talked about this last week, too. Exodus 6 6. You should have noticed this. Because God says this several times in the Bible. If you read your Bible, you'll see this several times in the Bible where God says this, especially the book of Isaiah and places like that in Jeremiah. But I want you to see something in Exodus 6, 6 that God pointed out to me and showed it to me. I mean, it just like it jumped off the page one day when I was reading it. I said, I get it. I get it. I see what he's talking about here. And it's, it's not just a phrase that got covered up in translation like these new Bibles have done. They've done away with this. But watch this in verse 6. 
Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the uh, border, uh, the burdens of the Egyptians, from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Look at me. What am I doing? I'm hanging on the cross. But what else am I doing? I've got an outstretched arm. And that's how God redeems you. He said, I'm going to redeem you with an outstretched arm. It's going to be out here like this. Now you can either go to the left side or the right side, but one way or the other, this, this is what you're going to have to confront when you come to God. You either reject Him or receive Him. That's why the two thieves on the cross, there was one that said yes to God, and the other one said no. The Bible says, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. I'll pour judgments out on them that hate you. I'll pour judgments out on them that persecute you. I'll pour judgments out on them that try to keep you back from doing what God wants you to do. I promise you, folks, just like he was in the Old Testament, he is today. He was with the children of Israel. He was behind them, and he was before them, and he was around them. And God is that way with you today. He'll make sure your enemies are scattered if you trust him. He'll remove them. I mean, literally, pack their bags and move them away. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I've seen him do it plenty of times. I had a guy one time that was opposing the, the, the work of the Lord we were doing. And I told him, I warned him, I said, you keep opposing the work of God and God's going to come calling you. And he's going to pour judgment out on you. And when he does, you're not going to like it. He said, what do you mean? I said, I mean God's going to kill you. And I didn't speak that lightly. I spoke that knowing the authority that God has given me as a preacher and given me the authority of this book. And I spoke the word of God to him. And I told him, I said, if you don't stop what you're doing, God will remove you permanently. And guess what God did? He removed him permanently. That's the God you serve. That's the God I serve. I tell people all the time, you better be careful how you handle God's man. And you better be careful how you handle God's children. You better be careful how you talk about them, how you handle them, how you do them, because God is watching you. He don't take too kindly to how you handle people the wrong way. Take your Bible and look over here at Psalm 77. I've seen it so many times, folks. I've seen it. I've begged people to get right with God. I've wept and begged them, crying, and they refused. And I walked out. I was at a house one time, and this guy and the Lord sent me over there, and I told him, I warned him, I said, you better stop playing with the occult stuff that you're messing with. He said, I'm not. And I looked over there and I said, there was a Ouija board on the table. I said, look at that Ouija board. He refused to hear the counsel of God. And God told me when I got out of there, he said, you shut the dust off your feet and never talk to him again and never pray for him again because I'm going to deal with him in judgment. Because I want the first one that was sent to him. Now that's the God of the Bible, folks. God will give you a space to repent, just like he did Jezebel in Revelation 20, I mean Revelation 2. He said, I gave her space to repent. I gave her time to repent of her fornication. She refused, so I'm going to cast her into judgment. I'm going to put her in a bed, and I'm going to cause judgment to fall on that woman and all those children that are with her. Look, when God gets a hold of you, it's a bad thing. I've, I've dealt with parents that refuse to do the right thing and they lose their children and then they come crying to the preacher and what do I say to them? You refuse to hear the counsel of God. 
Now your children are gone. Why? Because of a simple thing that you could have done. You could have got on your knees and got it right and you refused. We get Psalm 77 verse um, 15. The Bible says, Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and, jo and Joseph. Selah. That arm is still there today. The right hand of the Lord, the right arm of the Lord is still mighty to save. And God is saying that arm is still outstretched today, trying to redeem the people that will come to him. But God is a gentleman. He will not force you to be saved. He will offer the invitation. He will deal with you under conviction. But at the end of the day, you have a free will. And I have to remind people of that. God's not going to drag them to the altar. He can get them under so much conviction that I don't know how they could stand in the pew without getting to the altar. <laughs> I've, been, I've been in that situation when I got saved. I mean, I, I was ready for the preacher to shut up. I'm ready to get me out of man. I'm ready to get right with God. Hell was getting hot in that pew. <laughs> I could feel the flames. Hurry up. I might die before you end this message. <laughs> you know. That was me. I don't know how it was with you when you got saved, but that was me when I got saved. I was ready to get saved. I don't know what nobody gonna get in my way. I ran to that altar, buddy. I didn't walk, I ran. <laughs> Preacher, I need I need Jesus. Lead me to Christ. I'm ready. I, I need to get my heart to Christ. I don't want to go to hell. Redemption begins with the Passover. We talked about that. The place is announced that we talked about that. Now, let's talk about the redeemed. Who are the redeemed? Take your Bible and go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Now, God redeems several groups of people, but we want to zero in on us today, so we would go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Who is he redeeming today? 3.13. <clears throat> Paul's writing to the Galatians, a bunch of Gentiles. And the Bible says in verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us. Everybody say us. Okay. That's you and me. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That's interesting. Let me tell you why that's interesting. Because two people that day hung on a tree. Two very different people hung on a tree that day. I don't know if you've ever picked up on that when you read your Bible. But you had Christ. Alright? Christ is hanging on the tree. He's hanging on the cross for our sins. But somebody else went out that day and hung on a tree. You know who it was? Ain't that interesting? The Bible says Judas went out and hanged himself. There's two curses there. One, he becomes a curse for you. The other one, he took the curse because he refused to let Christ take it for him. A man that rejects Jesus Christ is under the curse. He is still under the curse. He's cursed. He's not loved by God. I get so sick of these marquees on these church signs. It's leading people to hell by the thousands. And right by there, the guy that has rejected Christ, blasphemed Christ, he goes by there, he reads the church sign, Smile, God loves you, no matter what you've done, no matter what you are, no matter what you're doing right now. That's a lie. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's a lie. God is not in love with you. God does not love you. As a matter of fact, if you're not saved and under Jesus Christ and you let Him take the curse for you, you become the curse and God hates your goods. You say, that's mean, preacher. No, that's not mean. That's Bible. 
It's time we let people know what kind of dire situation they're actually in. And if they fall off into eternity, they're not falling off into the hands of a loving God. They're falling into the hands of a God that's angry and is going to consume them. Now you that are saved today, He loves you. Specify, please. Thank you. Now God loves me. Ain't no doubt about it. If you're saved today, how many saved here? Let me see your hand. Alright, God loves you. I can say that. In the context of that. Alright? But, when we get a bunch of sinners in the church that don't know Christ... We better turn the heat up. We better get them sweating. We better get them thinking about where they're headed because it's not a place where they're going to party with their friends. See, redemption is the fact that Christ became a curse for you. So you would not be a curse in the eyes of God when you get before the Lord. That's the gospel. He took your place. The Bible says He was made a curse for us. But now, I want you to think about something. He gave you an even bigger picture of that. Remember the crown of thorns? What was it? Thorns? Go back to Genesis. Genesis. Boy, you get into Genesis, boy, you get into some deep stuff in those first three or four chapters. We tried to go, we tried to go through Genesis, Brother Earl, one time. We were on it for about two years. And we didn't get past chapter two. I mean, I mean that's how deep we got. Alright? We might try it again sometime, but uh right now, maybe not. Chapter uh let's see, chapter three. Let's see, let me look at these thorns here, let's see. Let me look over here. Alright, chapter 3, verse 17. The Bible says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it. <clears throat> all the days of thy life. Uh oh, look at verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Those thorns and thistles picture the curse that God put on the ground. And when Jesus Christ took those thorns and on his brow, he's taken the curse on his head. Can you thought about that? The Bible says in verse 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return into the ground, for out of it thou hast taken, for dust thou art, and in the dust shalt thou return. What did he tell the devil? Look over here to the devil. <clears throat> um, look back over here, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. And above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust. He just said man was dust. Did you notice here what the Bible says the devil's going to do? Dust shalt thou what? The devil's going to eat people. Be vigilant, be sober, for your adversary the devil goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may. See that thing? God told you right there what the devil's about. That's not talking about dust on the ground, that's talking about people. Because he just told you dust you are. And he said the devil's going to eat that dust. That's what the devil's about. That's what Jesus redeemed you from. If you're not redeemed and you step off into eternity, the devil's going to have a field day with you. And there'll be nobody there to redeem you. Because you rejected the redemption God offered. There's nothing else outside of it. 
There's a song that used to say, what would I do without Jesus? There's another one that says, where could I go but to the Lord? There's nothing else, folks. I've been out there in the world and done crazy things out there. There's nothing that they have to offer. Jesus Christ is the answer. He's not an answer. He's the answer. What are we redeemed from? Psalm 25, verse 22. Let's go there. We're going to hit these verses quick. So right on now. We'll get the, get the tape after we get it burned. Uh, there's a lot here, so I'm going to try to go through them pretty quick. Psalm 25, 22. <laughs> And 25.22, it says this. Here's what we're redeemed from. The Bible says, Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. God tells Israel that he's going to redeem them from all their troubles. That means every Arab that's over there in Palestine right now is going to be removed. Every Roman Catholic that's over there right now, illegally occupying that territory, is going to be removed. When you look at the way God gave you that territory over there, you know, Israel's like this. It's kind of like a little piece of territory that looks like that. <clears throat> but the Middle East, Ur of the Chaldees is up here like this. And I mapped it out. I got the map over there. I don't, I don't have to pull it out and show it to you. But when you map that thing out and you go where God says he's going to give them that land grant, it starts up here and it comes down like this to the uh, river Euphrates down here. Then it goes over here like this. And then it comes back up here like this. That's a triangle. Right here. Uh, young man, come up here for a minute. I'll show you something. I got something marked out. Let me see where have I got marked out. Let's see. Let's see where is it at up here? Hold down right there for me, buddy. All right, it's like this right here. It comes up here. It goes all the way down here to the River Euphrates right here. It does just like that. Then it comes back over here to this spot right here. Then it comes back over here like that. That's the land grant that God gave Israel. Now, do you know what that means? That means everybody in Jordan's got to get out. That means uh, a lot of people over here on this corner of Saudi Arabia have got to get out. That means the majority of Iraq, all those people there have got to get out. they got to come back over here, and all this up here in Syria belongs to Israel. And it comes all the way down here to Egypt, and all this right here belongs to God's people. It's a triangle, and it goes just like that. It's not this little piece right here. It gets smaller and smaller every time the UN gets involved. It gets bigger and bigger when God gets involved. That's the land grant that God gave Israel. God says He's going to redeem them from all their troubles. He's going to give them that piece of land that He told Abraham. That's in Genesis 15. That's in Genesis 12. And that's in Exodus chapter, um, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 1. That land grant is mapped out, and when you look at it, it's a triangle. And God says, that's what I'm giving you. And I'm going to redeem you from all your troubles. I'm going to get rid of your enemies. As a matter of fact, I'm going to set a table before you in the presence of all your enemies. They're going to watch you eat. Go to Jeremiah chapter 15. Anybody bored yet? Yeah. Jeremiah 15, verse 
God speaking prophetically. Here, this is a prophecy concerning the tribulation period. <clears throat> the Bible says, verse 20, he says, I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. That's the Antichrist. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. That's his armies. God says to Israel, I'm going to bring you out with a strong hand. When they see the Lord coming, they're going to know it's the Lord. There ain't going to be no mistake about it. There's holes in his hands. Hosea chapter 13. This is redemption playing out. Hosea chapter 13 verse 14. The Bible says in verse 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be thy plagues. O oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. The Lord says, Though he be fruitful among his brethren, and the east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry. It's talking about the Antichrist. His fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all the pleasant vessels. There's going to come a day, Brother Chuck, that you're going to be standing possibly in a graveyard. You might be grieving over a loved one. And all of a sudden the Lord's going to call your name. And all those that have gone before you that are dead in the graves. Those graves are going to burst open and we're going to go up together. There's going to be a revival in the graveyard. What better place to be in a graveyard on the day the Lord shows up. Amen. I get around these graves sometimes and I watch these mamas crying over their babies that have died young and my heart breaks for them. But I'm thinking one day, oh devil, you can't hold that one down. That baby's going to come out of that grave and he's going to come out fully ready to meet Jesus. All those babies that those abortion clinics have murdered are going to go up to be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. These murdering doctors that are killing these unborn babies, they're going to have something to answer for on the day of judgment. If they don't turn to the outstretched arm of Jesus Christ, their arms are going to be full of blood and God's going to judge them accordingly. As a matter of fact, the Bible says He'll judge them according to their works. Don't be caught on judgment day without Jesus Christ. Because God will not judge you according to Jesus Christ's righteousness. He's going to judge you according to your works. And your works are as filthy rags. Your righteousness is filthy rags. And if you want to be judged according to your works, have at it, buddy. I don't. I'd rather be judged according to Jesus Christ. Take your Bible and let's look at Titus chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> I enjoy my salvation. I sure do. I tell you, I get out of here sometimes and I just I just love it. I let the Lord teach me things. If you go out in the yard sometime, you know, cut the TV off, cut those computers off, cut those cell phones off, and just go outside in the yard and just walk around and just look at nature and look at the trees and the animals. God will take those things and teach you some things. God's taught me a lot watching nature. About His Word. I told you all about the hen. I watched those hens over there. Buddy, those hens, when they had them little babies, they'll walk around with them little chicks. And if they sense a predator, those, those roosters will, will make a certain sound. They're the, they're the watchers. See, a rooster in the yard 
is watching over that hen. He'll make a certain noise, and it sounds all the same until you tune your ear to hear it. But he'll make a certain noise, and all them hens will run and squat down and hide somewhere. And that rooster will be standing out there walking around. He'll get real quiet, and, and you'll hear a pin drop out there. And that hen will take those little babies, and she'll take them wings, and she'll spread them over those babies, and she'll tuck them up under her. And it don't matter what comes her way, she'll lay down her life. She'll die before you get them babies. She'll die before you get them. And Jesus Christ said, how often would I have gathered you as a hen does her babes? I'm paraphrasing now. And you would not. In other words, Jesus Christ is likening himself to that hen that comes in there and puts his wings over his children and he covers them and the enemy can't get them. He said, I want to do that to you, but you refuse. Titus chapter 2. I see those trees out there sometimes when the wind's blowing and they make all those noises. And I think about the fact that trees are likened unto people. And those branches out there are just waving and they're waving to the Lord and they're praising God and they're just making that noise. The Bible says they do. The Bible says the trees will praise God. Those branches out there are making all those clapping noises. And I hear that and I think about the children of God in heaven. When we get there around the throne and there's no, that noise is going to turn loose, it's going to be like a bunch of trees out there and the wind's blowing all around. Because the Bible likens God to a wind coming. And the Bible says it goes across those mulberry trees. How about that? Little things like that, brother. Or teach you something about God. Titus chapter 2, verse 14 says, well, let's look at verse 12. The Bible says, uh, well, verse 11, For the, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All men. Everybody's seen it. Whether they want to acknowledge it or not is irrelevant. The Bible says it's appeared to all men. Even those people down there in Africa that have never heard the gospel, he has appeared to them through nature. The Bible says nature teaches them about God. If they reject what God has given them in nature, the truth will not go forward. But if they receive what God's teaching them there, then He'll move on and give them the revelation of Himself. There is nobody so far in the jungle, so far out of civilization, that God can't reach them. Ain't that amazing? Even somebody in consolatory confinement can find God if they're hungry and seeking for Him. The Bible says it's appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now that word soberly there, this is what I was going to share you for church, brother. I was reading in my Bible the other day about sober and soberly and I was uh, running the references and that sober even though it's talking in the physical realm about keeping our senses about us, but it's talking about being spiritually sober. So you got to have a mind that's spiritually in tune and sober so that when the enemy comes, you won't go astray. you got to be spiritually sober. Sober-minded, see. <clears throat> the Bible says here that uh, righteously and godly in this present world. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from what? All iniquity. All iniquity. That's why 1 John chapter 3 verse 1, verse, 1 John chapter 3 verse 9 says, He that is born of God does not sin, commit sin. Ain't that nice? <laughs> Here, I, I've not sinned a day in my life since I've been saved. He said, that's a lie, preacher. No, nah, and it's not a lie. But I'm going to give you one that's going to blow your mind anymore. Every day I live, I miss the mark and I sin. 
You say you just contradict. You just say, no, I didn't. Don't you understand you're a tripart being? Don't you understand that you are flesh, a body, a soul, and a spirit? And my flesh sins every day. No doubt about it. Ain't no doubt about it. When, I mean, in my thoughts I sin, in my actions I sin, because there are things I ought to do that I don't do. I should read my Bible more and I don't. I should pray more and I don't. You say, well, it, uh, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about committing yourself to God in everything you do 100 times a day, 100%, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Are you doing that if you're not, you're sinning? Amen. Amen. I'll aim in myself. <laughs> but in my spirit man, the part of me that is born again, as far as God's concerned, He's looking at that man that's on the inside of me, and it's a sinless man, it is a perfect man, it is a flawless man, it is a man that is created in the image of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ don't sin. See the difference? So I'm not contradicting. I'm giving you an example of what, it depends on what you're talking about. And when Jesus Christ redeemed us, he redeemed us from all iniquity, and he purified in himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You ought to be zealous of good works. You ought to want to do something for God. You ought to want to live for God. You ought to want to talk about God. Share His Word in love and charity. When people see you, do they see Jesus or do they see an old grumpy person that, that's angry at everybody? What do they see when they see you? I get reports back from people sometimes that tell me about people when they're not around the preacher. They, uh, they're a whole different. I know a lot of people who profess to know Christ they, they, when they're outside the church and outside the walls of the uh, assembly here, they cuss like sailors, they talk like the devil, and they live like the devil. You ain't fooling nobody. God's watching you. He's got your number. He sees you when nobody else does. He sees you when you're sleeping. He sees you when you're awake. He knows if you've been naughty or nice, so be good for goodness sake. <laughs> That's Jesus. Go to Genesis 48. Genesis 48. We're going to wrap this up in a minute. Genesis 48. Bear with me, I'm going to go a little longer than 12. If you got to leave, go ahead and leave. It'll be okay. You won't be out of order. Genesis 48. And look at verse um, what did I say? 16. Probably one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament right here. The Bible says, The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. <clears throat> the Bible says, and when Joseph saw that he, his father laid his right hand upon the uh, head of Ephraim, it displeased him. He held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head under Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. His father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. That's a prophecy concerning Israel as a nation growing out versus the Arabs that didn't. But God in this verse, in verse 16 says, concerning Jacob, he says, the angel which redeemed me. Who could that be? Jesus. That's right. Capital he is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And it says he redeemed me from all evil. Isn't that amazing? Jacob said that. You ever read of what Jacob went through? All the things that Jacob did? 
good and bad. And the Bible says here at the end of his life, he's looking back over his life and he says, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads. You bless your children? Do you? Do you pray with them? Do they see Jesus in you? It's not do as I say. It's do as I do. And and, and my little man, I'll give you an example of my little man. When we we were driving to school, he knows. I lay hands on him and I pray for him. I say, little man, I'm going to pray for you. Let's let's get ready to pray. And we pray and I pray for God's protection to be on him. And God's blessing to be on him. God's grace to be with him. When we have kids come over like uh, Zane did last night, Boy, y'all should have prayed for me last night. I got more great in. <laughs> but they're, they're good. And they get in there and play. They're comfortable here. They feel God's presence. The peace of God is there. That's what people should feel when they come to your house. We have people come out here during the week from other places, and they'll just sit out here and they'll say, I just love it out here. It's so peaceful. I'm away from the rat race because God's presence is here. I pray over this place. I pray over this yard. I ask God's presence to be here from that road when they enter that driveway, when they come through that gate. I want God's presence to be manifest in such a way when people come, they know God's here. When they come through here, buddy, there ain't no devil here. He's standing at the gate out there trying to get in. He can't get in. I got angels all over this place watching. Amen. Is it real to you like that? Because it's real to me. (laughs) Amen. The angel which redeemed me is Jesus Christ. We'll close with this one. This is a good one. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 29. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 29. Me and my wife, we have so much fun out here. It's like a little play garden. <laughs> Yeah. I tell the kids, y'all play anywhere in the yard you want. You better not step on my flowers, though. <laughs> We're going to fight. First Kings chapter 1, verse 29. The Bible says in verse 29, And the king swore and said, As the Lord liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all what? Distress. I see a lot of Christians today that are distressed. I see a lot of Christians today that are trying to carry the burdens of life that God says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. But you want to still carry the burdens. You still want to carry the stress of life. And God's saying, don't carry it. Let me carry it. Put it on my shoulder. I'm well equipped to do the job. Rest in the Lord. I don't care if the world's on fire. Rest. I've read the end of the book. I know who wins. And I believe it. It's a reality to me. I had a guy come to me at work the other day. He's a avowed atheist. He come to me and he was he never talks to me. Never. But it was the devil in him that came to me. And he came to me and he had this sneering look on his face. And he looked at me and he said, Don't take this the wrong way, preacher. Well, I already knew what was coming. He said, It must be nice to have an imaginary friend to talk to. I said to him, he's not imaginary. 
He's very real to me. He said, to you is. I said, yeah. I said, but it must be awful bad for you that when you get in trouble, you have nowhere to go. <laughs> and your life tells a story that you're miserable, you're wretched, and you are distressed, and you have nobody to give your burdens to. I told an atheist this one time. I said, let's, let's just look at it like this, uh, young man. Most of them are young, you know. It's the generation we're growing up in today. And, it, and most of them haven't lived life enough to realize there is a God. But I told him, I said, if, if everything that I've ever taught here is wrong and I die and there's no God, I've lost nothing. I've lost nothing. I've had peace all my life. I'm, I'm happy. I've, I've got joy. I mean, I've, I've lived a clean life. I've lived pretty good. And i got a family. And, and we do right. And we live right. I haven't lost anything. I said, but buddy, if you're wrong, you've lost everything. Because the moment you take your last breath, you're going to find out the reality of God. Because He's going to consume you in His fire. And that's where you're going to be for eternity. While He looks at you and laughs at you. A nightmare waiting to happen. It'll make a nightmare on Elm Street look like nothing. It'll be a nightmare that you'll never be able to come back from. Amen. Redemption is a beautiful thing, folks. I love talking about it. It's one of my favorite subjects in the Bible. We're going to close right there. And we'll pick up next time. Um, next week we're going to talk about the second advent, the Redeemer comes back to Zion, and we're going to show you all the scriptures that tie into that and give you a rundown of how that works. And then, the, and then we'll talk about how the Redeemer is identified. All right. God bless you. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this message. We thank you for the redemption, Lord, that comes through the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Take these things we've studied today, Lord, and hide them in our hearts. Lord, may we ponder upon them and may we study them out. May they become real to us in such a way that we fall in love with the Redeemer all over again. May the honeymoon never die when it comes to our relationship with you. May it always be a joyous ride in the Lord. I pray for these saints here that you put into my trust, Lord, that you will be with them, protect them, keep them safe till we come together again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Tonight at 4 o'clock, we'll be doing our uh, Q&A. Come with your questions, and uh, after that, we'll do a communion service. God bless you, Brother John. Hey, have a wonderful afternoon. All right.